So fun fact about Tori, she always leaves the toilet seat up and it drives oh me my nuts. I'm not a man. I'm not a man. I don't <sighs> understand how that's relevant to you. Like, if I you already can... noticed you've been here for five minutes. Toilet seats are up. Let's roll even... the intro. Welcome back to Potty Talk, the, the podcast, podcast where, where we, we shit talk, talk ourselves. ourselves. I'm Jack. And I'm Tor. And we are fresh in spring allergy season, and I sound <laughs> like a man. So if you guys like uh, ASMR, we're going to have some Kleenex and sneezing ASMR this episode, so sorry in advance for that. But uh, Well, I don't suffer from allergies, so if you want that nice speaking voice, welcome, because I am in perfect health. And Jacqueline is ill, so. I'm not ill, okay, to clarify, not ill, just allergy -y. We actually were doing, <laughs> we're training for a half marathon, which is kind of hilarious. Yeah, this is ridiculous. I mean, I'm actually the slowest of the group, and that is no word of a lie. Jacqueline is actually the fastest of the group. So, yeah, I mean, initially we thought we were getting into this as friends and that we'd run it together, but it's become very clear very quickly that she will be running ahead of me during this race. <laughs> to be fair, we're also, like, I'm double your height, so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm five. Don't feel on a bad day, about so. it. Yeah, but no, it's definitely been a lot more confronting than we realized. We initially got approached to do like um, a half marathon for like a charity run, and we're like, that sounds awesome, and we enjoy working out for fun. Yeah, we're not fitness gurus by any mean. No, by any means, but um, yeah, I don't know. We might have gotten a little, a little in over our head. Yeah. We got these magnets. So we're we we're working with Nike actually on it. This is not an ad, but I wish it was. Um, Tori, your phone volume, dude. Is on. I literally put it. I. Okay. It's literally on. I can see on the side. No, but I... Okay, it's, Just turn, it's silenced. Podcast one-on-one -on -one over here. We got the uh, marathon schedules, like our training schedules from our Nike coach, and on our Saturday runs, like we we're supposed to run, like, what, three times a week? Yeah, it's not going to happen, but... I mean, I mean, I, I have to run three times a week to make this work, but we'll see. Yeah, the Saturday runs are like, oh, yeah, go out and jog, like, 15K. I'm like, that's, that's a half a marathon that's for me normal. in itself. Yeah, that's not normal. So yeah, we'll keep you guys updated with how that pans out. But I'm actually, I'm, I'm glad we're doing it. I feel like I would have never done a half marathon if it wasn't for this opportunity. So Yeah, I'm, if it wasn't forced truly upon me, I don't <laughs> think I would ever choose to do it. So. Yeah, when we were running yesterday, I was, we were doing actually um, some laps around a track. And just being outside in nature, which I feel like I'm normally not, um, I realize that my allergies have really taken a toll. And it's very inconvenient that today is now when we're filming because I am just... Congested. <sighs> yeah, sounding delicious. Ew, that's disgusting. <laughs> um, anyways, we had a very exciting week here in Toronto the past, what, week and a bit? Because the Raptors weeks. are yeah. moving on to the finals. They are moving on. And I just have to say, I mean, as someone who grew up as a hockey fan, I, like... This bandwagon has just been unreal. Like, you know, getting on board at the, the end of the season when things get exciting is truly my favorite pastime. Like, it's so fun. The whole city is alive. The parties. I just love drinking with everyone. Everyone's so excited. And actually, did you see the police report that said that um, there was no arrests made that night? Can Aww, you believe that? That's kind of beautiful. I was like, go Toronto. That's so Canadian. It's so Canadian. Like, everyone's just so calmly celebrating the, well, the Raptors win. I don't know. Well, it wasn't calm, though. Did you see the video? So, but you were, actually, you weren't even in town. No, this you was, were... like, the saddest thing. I was in London, Ontario, which is so off-brand for me as a person in general. Mm. So, I just, like, I... Ugh. I mean, I was... My boyfriend's from London, Ontario shouts out. I mean, not that that's a positive thing at all. But, anyways, I was there we're gonna visiting family. all of family. our viewers <laughs> from London, Ontario be like, that was so rude. I was we there, love you guys. But, yeah, but I'm from Toronto, so I'm, like, a city girl through and through. So, taking me out of the city is, like taking my soul out of my freaking chest like it's just horrible so anyways I was not in Toronto so then I was even more butthurt and had more FOMO because I'm seeing all the Twitter and Facebook posts about the celebrations and I'm sitting in London Ontario just like crying into my wine glass absolutely crazy I I wasn't even watching the game that's how wow I was like tucked in bed by like nine o'clock that night that's disgusting. and I woke up at probably like what like 11 o'clock and I just hear like chaotic screaming like the biggest celebration and you can just hear the entire town is booming yeah. horns are going off and then later on Twitter I saw that I think it was at right at like Front Street and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. where people were at on Union the Station. Cars. Yeah, they were on yeah. top of a police car, just I like know. jumping on top of the buses, and it was like a chaotic celebration. But everyone was so happy, and just like Drake gives me hope, and like the Raptors give me hope, and I'm just happy. Well, I just feel like we have so much pride and like such a community. Well, especially because the Leafs have just let us down so many times. <laughs> we don't really have other teams we can rely on. So the fact mm -hmm. that now. 
uh, Kawhi has like brought us to the end and like has made this just the most exciting season is just enlightening. And we're not sporty girls really by any means. So the fact that like we're still super involved, I think says a lot about the spirit of the city. Well, I just feel like we're such Toronto girls now. Like I mean, I, I grew up, I, I didn't live in Toronto. I lived about an hour and a half outside um, from a lovely small town called Caledonia. Unheard uh, of by most people. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm really happy in hindsight. I'm so glad that I grew up in a small town. Um, but I, we were lucky that it was so close to Toronto that it was just like an hour and a half kind of drive away. But now living here, I actually love Toronto so much. And I honestly didn't think growing up that I would be here permanently. I mean, I mm-hmm. always knew that like it was kind of, I don't want to say a stepping stone, but like for me, I was like, I'm so going to be moving to the States when I'm older. Like that as a right. child, that was my like dream, the vision. Yeah. And I for sure thought I was going to end up in the States. And now that I'm here and have been living here for like five years, I'm like, there's no way I'm leaving anytime soon. Yeah. I don't think ever. I think I will always have a home base here. Same. I agree, which is interesting because I grew up in Toronto and so I always thought I'd want to go to the next best thing. But I lived in New York for a bit when I was in... Uh, I guess right before university, I lived there for a summer doing a program at NYU. And then I also lived in LA, I guess my second year of university when I was doing a program at UCLA. But then both of my experiences led me to believe, hmm, maybe Toronto really is the right place for me. Wait, what did you not like about it? Well, I I think New York, I wasn't quite ready for it yet. I guess Mm. I was only 16 or 17. So it felt really lonely. And I guess even when you get older, like I've heard people and friends who live there say the same um, thing. So it's not that I was just thrown off maybe because I was young, because I obviously always felt way more mature than my peers. But I I did feel like... I was gifted. (laughs) No, but I did feel like I had a lot more life experience by the time I was 17 than most people. I had obviously been working professionally since I was 14. There was already a lot of like things that I had checked off my bucket list and had worked on. Um, But I really did feel lonely while I was there. And and then when I went to LA, I just... Just the people there give me major anxiety. Like, <laughs> seriously, like they're and now all of our LA fans hate us. So great work. Well, here's the thing. Like, I love visiting LA. My best friend Madison lives in LA. I still continue to go there all the time. And I love being there for a short amount of time. But this was my analogy when I got back from LA, and it still rings true to me. When I got back, my parents said, How did you feel about your time in LA? And I said, Well, Los Angeles is like a cheesecake. You get there and you're like, Oh my God, this is the sweetest and most rich dessert I've ever had. I want it all the time. It's just so indulgent and fabulous and luxurious. And then by the end, you're like, by the end of the three months that I'd lived there, I was like, Holy shit, I never want to eat a piece of cheesecake ever again in my life. And that, that was, was just... Is that your quote? That was my analogy when That's I got home. Beautiful. And I said that to my parents when I was, like, probably 18. I was just, you know, so profound about it. But I truly still mm. believe that it rings true because it is just so much. It's so much of everything. It's so fake. It's so, ugh, like, processed and, like, you know, sugary. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's very... Like, if you are in that kind of crowd or that group, like, it's hard to stay away from all of that bad, like, yeah. toxic energy that I feel like you hear everyone talk about, like, the downside of L.A. Totally. I think Mm -hmm. we've also been able to really leverage our audiences in a more strategic way being in Canada because not every single person is doing what we're doing. Like, it's really hard to stand out in a town where every person is basically rooting to do the exact same thing, whether that's acting or whether that's, you know, becoming a blogger or influencer, YouTuber, all of these things. It's like... I fully always said that I would not have a sustainable career if I did not live in Toronto and do no. YouTube. Because you go to LA and it's like the big dogs and it's everyone and you're what a small fish in a big pond. And totally. I would fully not have survived. I would have had to stop and, you know, do something else. There's no way. I think there's also a beauty in, like, making the creative industries in Canada more of a hub and more of a place where people want to be. I think there was a lot of backlash against Drake recently, actually, like, in reference to all of our Raptors talk about how, you know, like, he's just, like, taking too much credit and all of these things. And it's like, okay, but... He put Toronto on the map, though, I feel like. He put Toronto on the map. There's even, like, stats that I heard, I was reading about that were saying that, like, he is really influenced our tourism in Toronto and has really impacted the amount of people that come to visit our city. And I think the same rings true for us. Like, if we can stand up and, like, advocate for how awesome it is to live in Canada, then, like, I don't see a problem with No, that. and that's, like, truly what I believe. Now that I'm here, I'm like, Toronto is the best city ever, and I would not trade it for the world, and I'm just so obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, and it is kind of, not that it's sad, because I totally understand why many business people do this and why many up-and-coming YouTubers or whatever, eventually, once they have a little bit of success here in the city, 
kind they of leave. like exactly it's the story where everyone then goes to LA and they pursue it there yeah and we live in such an interesting time that our jobs it doesn't matter where in the world you are you can still do what you do because we have yeah, the it's internet so mobile and like that you can be anywhere mobile, yeah for sure so I mean sure some people can argue that they do need to be in LA to do it but I think there really is a beauty in like you were saying making Toronto that creative hub and like why can't it be here right so I mean, knock on wood, someone's going to play this, like, in 10, 10 years, years we're in L.A. in L.A. We're like, yeah, just kidding. Actually, just kidding. Yeah, Tr- or L.A.'s, like, where we need to be. <laughs> but e- e- even mm-hmm. if that was the case, I would be in New York way faster than I would be in L.A. It's See, just way more on brand for me. So. And I grew up always saying that I was going to be in L.A. It's, yeah. <laughs> when you look back, though, at all your failed childhood dreams, it's very confronting. But True. If you were to ask me when I was... Up until probably, like, 16. I mean, I grew up thinking I was going to be an actress. That was my thing. I started acting when I was, like, six years old and just doing, like, small little things here and there. And it wasn't until I was, like, probably 11 that I booked the role on Dino Dan. And I was doing that for, like, two and a half, three years. Two and a half years, something like that. Um, And then after that, I didn't do anything, like, really notable other than just small little one-off things. And I was like, oh, this is not what I thought. Like, I thought... The Nick Jr. show was going to, like, be a stepping stone to all these other things. Right. And it's kind of confronting when you're like, okay, I'm putting in all this effort. And especially with the acting industry, I think it's really hard because you can be putting in your heart and soul and everything into it. Doesn't mean you're going to get anything out of it. Exactly. It's not your call. It's the casting director. It's the director. It's that team that's like, no or yes. And it was really hard for me to understand that I could be doing everything right. And And still not book the role. Exactly. Yeah. And having control is maybe something that I have a problem with. I wanted to be in control. No, totally. And so that was really hard for me. And then kind of like deciding, okay, how do I reroute this? Because I think craziness or insanity is when you keep on doing the same thing and expecting different yeah, results. Yeah, yeah. And I was like 16 at the point where I was graduating school early. And I was like, where? Do, what do I do now? Yeah. I let this like acting thing kind of define and be like the... um the drive into your exactly career, yeah. into everything and and then when I was like okay now what do I do mm-hmm. what's the game plan and I didn't know and that like honestly I think I cried myself to sleep every night for a good year in high school just being so stressed out about like the future and what my path like, was who and, would you be yeah totally yeah and then looking back you're like oh all of that actually I think led me to where I am today in the sense that I was so lucky that I grew up like working on camera understanding that industry a bit yeah and feeling confident being on camera now doing what we do totally and then also I ended up going to school for makeup and then working in the film and tv industry doing makeup and I was really fortunate I got hired on by the same production company that did the show when I was younger yeah um shout out to to, (laughs) shout out to sinking ship you guys have been great um and then even just understanding the more back end of that world and understanding like Mm -hmm. the whole crew side of things I feel like again has helped me with my youtube and in doing all of this because I just have such a greater understanding so yeah it's one of those things where you truly can only connect the dots looking back and be like, oh, I did that for so many years to kind of prepare me for what I'm doing now. We were saying that, like, how you can only really tell, you can never, you oh. can never fully understand it until it's in retrospect. Oh, like, totally. unless you have that five years to really look back and say, oh, that's why that happened, or oh, that's why that put me in that direction. Mm-hmm. But when you're so stuck in it, it's really hard to to swim out of it. No, because it makes no sense. Yeah. If I was, whatever, 14 and someone was going to be like, Jacqueline in whatever, how old am I now? 21. Um, in seven years, you're going to be doing YouTube full time. You're going to be living in Toronto. You're mm-hmm. going to be doing X, Y, Z. And like, I would have never believed that. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What did you think when you were like 14? What did you think your like route was or your game plan or where do you think you'd be now? Yeah. It's ironic because actually I never thought I was going to be an actor. Like, I remember being on set of Life with Boys. Yeah, I remember, like, (laughs) being literally the lead of a TV show and being like, yeah, this is, like, not my path. And a huge Nickelodeon show, too. It wasn't just some random Joe Blow. Yeah, it wasn't that I wasn't obsessed with the experience because I totally was and I was enthralled by it and I learned so much and and it still to this day rings as like one of my most favorite experiences in my life but I do remember having conversations with producers and even like makeup artists you know you're like chatting in the makeup Mm -hmm. desk and they'd be like oh so you know what's next what's after this and I always remember being like yeah well you know like I have so many other passions I have so many other interests Mm -hmm. like I would hate to only put my you know like as as you would say, like eggs in one basket type yeah. of thing. And I think it goes back to what you were talking about, ha- not having that control. It was always very obvious yeah. to me that I did not have control in that 
uh, industry because you're really relying on other people to give you those opportunities wherein nowadays I would say you and I, much like this podcast, are just going to create opportunities for ourselves because we're passionate about so many different things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like the idea that I was going to end up in this shoebox that someone was going to say, oh, well, you know, like we're going to typecast her like this and she's only going to get roles like this. Yeah. And again, it's like such an ego game. You're going to these auditions. You're putting all this time in. You're not necessarily <laughs> getting the role. And that is exhausting. And I think... I think mentally also kind of like... Mentally and physically you. exhausting. But yeah. it's interesting because I think as a kid, I was way better at handling that. Oh, but yeah. as I enter my 20s or as I entered my 20s, I started to get really fed up about how that industry was working because I didn't... I think some of it is still, we have talked about, a little bit archaic. Like, you're doing these self-tapes, but then who's actually watching them? Like, I'm paying $100 to make a Mm self-tape, but, like, can I confirm the casting director is actually going back and looking at my work? Like, all of it is, it it hasn't quite adapted into our, like, digital age yet, Mm -hmm. I feel, um, in some ways. I still find it interesting, though, that there's there's tends to be a lot of, like, animosity between, like, the whole digital world and, like, influencers or YouTubers and the whole traditional media world, whether it be acting, TV, film, all that 100%. stuff. 100%. They and at, hate us. And at first, when I was 16, and I mean, I still, like, I still have my acting agent. I still go out on a few auditions and stuff, but it's not, like, anywhere, like, the scale that I used to do before because yeah. YouTube is, like, more my focus. Um, I'm also just trying to make sure that if any casting director is watching this, they don't hate me for, th- for saying any of this. Um, but I remember at first, I was talking to my agent when I was, like, starting my YouTube channel, and I was like, do you think this is, like, a bad thing? call kind of thing and this is back in like 2014 so I feel like YouTube it wasn't as like like known yeah well everyone does YouTube now but like back then it was still like a little bit of like a weird like oh she's a weirdo for making a video on the internet and a lot of people actually actually like not I don't want to say shied away and told me not to do it but a lot of people were like a little hesitant like I don't Mm. know if this is a good look for your acting thing or like whatever And I got to the point where I was like, well, I don't care. I'm not booking any roles right now, so I'm going to sit and do something that's fun. And I never went into it. Like, I don't know about you. I mean, I don't think you did either with your whole Instagram thing. But for me, YouTube was never like, I have a business plan. I'm 16. I'm going to make this my career. No, no, no. I was fully just like, I'm on my gap year. I'm bored. And I just, like, want to make videos. And I was watching YouTube all the time. And I was like, I just want to be that. I want to do that. I want it to be, like, the Mac Barbie 07 or, like, the Juicy Star 07. Like, all those girls that, like, really, I feel like paved the way for beauty gurus back in the day and I just wanted to do that I think and we, then, we continue to be lucky though because in some ways like we were at the cusp of what that entire industry has become oh, so in like in a so lot lucky. of ways like it would be harder for people to build audiences and and kind of like get to maybe the level we've been able to get at thus far like mm-hmm. in our span of time because it really hasn't been that long that we've been doing this but now it's so saturated and now everyone's trying to do it that's so um, true Anyways, back to my story about acting. Oh, sorry, did I have to cut you off? No, not really. I, I just have a we were ta- no, no, we were just talking about um, casting and all that stuff. But oh yeah, being archaic. Yeah, like or just or just not necessarily like modernizing as fast as kind of the influencer YouTube digital world has right, has it's so fast paced. Except for like Netflix, who's doing like kind of an amazing job at like all of their original content and all of those things. But I think in Canada, like we we collectively have work to do to make our industry more exciting mm-hmm. and like more you know fruitful. Um, but anyways, my childhood, I was talking about like not necessarily wanting to be an actor. Mm-hmm. I always went back to the idea that I wanted this, like, business foundation. I don't know where that came from. You've always been very school-driven. Totally. Like, kind of a nerd deep down, like, really into the more, like, theoretical, analytical, like, side of things. And also, like, those, like, tactical skills, like, negotiation and, like, pitches. And I always had a lot of interest in that. So... I think it, it in some ways, does not surprise me that I ended up going to university for that because I think it mm-hmm. actually, deep down, was something I was always very passionate about, even though on the surface level, everyone thought I was going to be a performer. Right. So it was more like a perception of what people thought I was, and then there was a bit of, like, I felt like people thought maybe I had failed because I didn't go that direction. Oh, but it was, really? Well, maybe, but I think it was much more like a personal choice. Like, I mean, I didn't, my goal was that I wanted to, at one point, go to Broadway like I was gonna go more theater route and like not do film and television then when that dream was like crushed when I didn't get into NYU which was like a whole other different story but I think not getting into the university of your choice it's crushing is crushing but also like kind of amazing because it like really forces you to fail in a really extreme way that is not necessarily going to impact your life in in any 
crazy way once you look back at it. Like, yeah. you know what but I mean? Like, time. failure is, like, so important. Like, when I look back, it was probably the most pivotal time for me. But at the time, it was, like, the worst thing that have co- could have possibly happened. But the reality was, like, no one had died. I hadn't lost a million dollars. Like, it wasn't... It's not failure in the real world. It's failure as a teenager. Well, it's that whole thing that you're talking about when you have that like path kind of structured in your head, like X Y Z is going to happen, yeah, and then I'm going to do this. You have it all. Like you feel out. like your world's crashing down. I'm sure. Were you like, what was? Oh the my aftermath? god! I literally laid. I remember specifically laying out in the field of my high school in the grass, just like <laughs> head up to this guy, and I was like, I'm done. I was like, my life is, is over. This is it. And I got really lucky because at the time we were actually right in the middle of our like annual performance, like our theater. At Big, yeah, our big, like, show, and I was one of the leads of the show, so there was a lot of pressure on me, and I was clearly underperforming because, like, emotionally, I was just yeah. unavailable. And actually, we had this naturopath who used to come in. Her name was Helga, a lovely, lovely lady. And she sat with me, and she, like, hugged me, and I just started, like, literally bawling. And then Uh she told me her story about how, like, she hadn't initially gotten into med school and, like, all of these things and how her path just ended up, like, working out. Um, And... Yeah, she really helped me through that, so shouts out Helga. But I think the lesson there is if you're in that, like, really dark moment, it actually can be super helpful to talk to someone very much outside of it. Because I don't think I would have, like, broken down that way if it was, like, chatting with my parents or even a friend. Because it's hard to be that vulnerable when you totally have felt like you've failed yourself. Yeah. And it's, like, your biggest dream. Um yeah, like I took some time off school. I was like, oh, really? Yeah, I was not recovery. good. I was not good. But I do really think that's like such an important life skill to have. And something that I've kind of gained in hindsight as well is like adaptability and also being able to roll with the punches. Because realistically, like yeah. in anyone's life, not everything is going to kind of follow that formula you have no. in your head. I think but it's, it's how hard. you recover or still reroute the path mm-hmm. to get where you want to get to. It's not until you get older that you get a little better at that. And like you start to learn like opportunities are like buses. There's always one around the corner. Yeah. But it's really hard to see that when you're younger I think oh, for sure well it's like the what was the quote about uh from Qu- from from Chris Jenna there's the speech impediment coming out Chris Jenner oh Chris Jenner um you can tell I'm still half asleep uh Chris Jenner said the other day <laughs> what did she say keeping up um if someone says no you're asking the wrong person yeah and I kind of love that quote because it is true it's yeah. like yeah it's up to you, and no one's going to advocate for yourself as much of as yourself. Of course not. So if someone says no or shuts an idea down, figure it out. Go with someone else. Make it happen. Yeah. It's, if it's something that you truly know you have to do or it's kind of the next step, figure it out. I've also, like, met some women later in my life that I think have really put that to the test and, like, have been told no a bajillion times. And it's mm-hmm. really crazy to see the success they can reach when they just will not take no for an answer. Yeah. And And... It's possible, like, but you really have to want it, and you really have to care, and I think that's how you grow, and that's how you become successful, honestly, by just not not constantly feeling like the world is at ends with you. We have friends that think that the world is out to get them, and, like, there's this, like, negative energy and vibe around people, and, and that just attracts more negativity. Well, it's like what we were talking about. Like, we say this all the time. Mindset totally changes everything. Yeah. So, yeah. If like, you're- if you approach things with that negative energy, why would you expect anything to come back at you in a positive way? Yeah. Or you're just so blinded by that that you can't see guess, any of the good things I guess. that are happening yeah. as well. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it, it's super crazy, and it, it's hard, though. I feel like also, because I feel like on the reverse, like, back in high school, I kind of, like, went through some moments of, like, being super down and just, like, so confused about life. When you're in it, it feels so hard to get out of. Yeah. Like, I feel like right now, and it's almost scary because I feel like I'm on a roll in the sense that mentally, I feel like I'm in a good spot. I feel very motivated with my work. Yeah. I feel very inspired. I feel like I'm fully able to achieve everything that I'm setting out to do. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, like, still dying from this no, it's phlegm. Fine. Um, I think I think it's interesting, but, too, because it comes in waves, right? Oh, so and that's the scariest part, though. I'm yeah. like, things are going so good. When am I going to crash? When yeah. am I going to, like, fall into a deep depression yeah, again? Like, yeah, no, it's what? true. And it, it's almost frightening when... But you don't want to think like that. Like, no, you can't. Worst. And and when the highs come, you have to ride the highs because there are lows. And, and, you know... Well, and you never know, especially in this industry, 
when this is going to get swept, like the rugs and get pulled from under our feet. Because we talked about this with Instagram recently. They rolled yeah. out their algorithm that basically. <laughs> sorry, guys. Jacqueline is dying I'm from sorry. her allergies. I need a minute. Okay, the phone has been cleared. Yeah, we were chatting recently about how Instagram had changed their analytics, um, specifically in Canada, which I just think is an extreme target against us. But anyways, they were taking likes, visible likes, away from people's profiles. So now brands and or your followers would not be able to see how many likes you're getting on a photo. It this, was a mental health this initiative. This was a mental right? health initiative about basically helping young kids not invest so much time and effort into likes um, and into sort of that, like, what the world perceives as of your online identity. So I'm aligned with that. I totally agree. And I think that if we had had Instagram at that age, like, oh, we would have been way more been messed up. Way more messed up and, and all of those things because our identities were already very much set in, t- in stone by the time that I was sharing things online with an audience. Well, I think the difference is with that generation and even looking down to younger people like my cousins, they're like at the cusp of it. They're like in grade eight and grade 10 right yeah. now and they've like grown up with Instagram and all of that. And we were lucky we had a taste of social media, but it was not to the extent that it is now. But for them... Well, like, it was Facebook, but even then it was like... It was, it's different though. And you couldn't really get yourself into too much trouble on Facebook. I mean, I guess you could if you were sharing the wrong things, yeah, but it, it, it was, was more like different. chatting with friends and like totally. you know, messaging the boys to like and all those things. But the difference is that for a lot of younger people these days, I feel like we're Wait, so shouts out MSN. Yo, what? who remembers oh, MSN? I was never allowed to have MSN. What? Okay, no, I was MSN was like the best thing ever and it was like cap, you'd like write out captions and you'd always like message your crushes. Okay, I, I was okay, never this is the most iconic this. throwback. I remember sitting in my friend Shireen's house on MSN, we were messaging this guy we liked when Justin Bieber released one time. And oh. she goes, hey, look, this guy just released this music video. He's wearing the purple American Apparel sweater. Was never in the Justin Bieber And I was face. like, wow. And I just look back and I think, hmm, now he's married. <laughs> <laughs> to Haley Bieber. Yeah. Wow. We actually, we went to some random masterclass event and Haley was there as like the model getting her makeup done at some Bare oh, Minerals event. I about that. And we were truly... In blown awe. away. Like She's she was beautiful. a goddess. And we were like, her ankles are so nice. She has the best ankles I've ever seen, and I fully stand by this. Yeah. And her ring, oh my God. Actually, so funny story her about Haley. Face, yeah. Yeah, no, she's ridiculously stunning and very like just very sweet. Regal and regal. Oh, like yeah. looks just so rich. So funniest story about Haley Bieber, she was actually my very first interview ever. Oh, yeah, at Much. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, so, I mean, I always grew up wanting to, like, be hosting and interviewing, and now that I work with Much, I get to do that, which is still the craziest thing ever. But it was my very first MMVAs, which is, like, the Much Music Video Awards, kind of equivalent to the American version of the VMAs, like the Video Music Awards. Um, and Much Music is kind of like the Canadian version of MTV for context for any American viewers. Um, anyway, so it was the very first MMVAs that I was attending as someone who was supposed to be there, not as a fan at the sidelines, which I used to go as a fan yeah. to watch the red carpet go down. So I was interviewing inside the building during the show, and I think it was called the one-on-one suite or something, which sounds very intense now. Uh, anyway, so basically, long story short, what would happen is that the talent would be walking by in between like the show and them going to the green rooms, and people on my team would kind of help pull those people in, pull their publicists in and be like, hey, we're doing a thing for MTV. Come in, we're filming an interview kind of thing. But this was so unstructured that you didn't really know who you would get or who would even she be down to do it. walks in. So what happens, I'm sitting there and I'm like so nervous. I'm 18 at the time and I'm just like, I've got like riddled with acne and I've got layers of makeup on. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. I can't believe I'm riddled in this, in this like building right now. And I'm thinking the whole time, we're going to get kind of the smaller talent. There's a lot of people that go to the MMVAs that don't even, like, make it, say, in the actual live show, but just lots of different artists that kind of come for the party and to stay mm-hmm. backstage and whatever, to network, blah, blah, blah. So I'm thinking we're going to get kind of those guests, not necessarily, like, our headlining, like, main talent. I think that must have been the year. Was that the year Gigi Hadid was hosting, or maybe? That would make sense. Or maybe it was the year after. I can't remember. Anyways, Gigi Hadid's there, Haley Bieber, or Haley Baldwin at the time. And all of a sudden, we get a knock on the door, and a publicist comes in, and they go, and, like, I'm just, I'm been sitting in this room waiting for a half an hour. Nothing's happened. Like, I'm just sitting there waiting. <laughs> and we get a knock on the door, and the publicist comes in and goes, okay, I've got Haley Bieber here. She's down to do this. No questions about Bieber. No questions about Drake. Let's film this. They said no questions about Bieber at that Which time? Which is so interesting. Now, in hindsight, I don't know if this is, like, confidential. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be saying this on camera. I don't think it's confidential now. They're and, married. Yeah. 
And at the time, it was so funny. Yeah, I was told I was not allowed to talk about Bieber. And it was really funny because the whole segment that we were filming was, um, like, kind of Canadian-themed questions. So it was, like, oh, God. things about Justin Bieber. And I was like, okay, got it, ma'am. Like, no questions about Bieber. Bring her in, bring her in. Yeah. And she came in, and she was the sweetest person ever. And there's still video footage of this. You can go on my YouTube channel and pull up this interview. You can tell I'm, like, so nervous and giddy. And she was honestly so, so sweet. And Aww. ever since that moment, like, I always had such a good impression from her. Because yeah. she made me feel so comfortable. She was so receptive for my very first interview yeah, ever and like so, nice. so I always have like the best things to say about her I think she's the sweetest yeah and she's and she beautiful was really nice when we met her too like, yeah and again good vibes great energy Haley Bieber wow great work girl well we were chatting about Instagram and the analytics and kind of how we are at the mercy of these platforms yeah that are rolling out all of these changes and I don't know I've always been such a pessimist about the industry obviously I'm a big part like I play into the industry but at the same time I've always felt like this like, they are holding the key to my death, Well, it's of. true. And I think when you have things like, say, when Instagram takes away your likes and that's what you're so reliant on to sell to companies, to sell to advertisers, to whatever, be like, oh, I get this much engagement, I get this many likes. Yeah. It's scary because it makes you realize that this can be pulled from under our feet so quickly and that we're so reliant on platforms that we have no control over. I know. I'm reliant that the YouTube algorithm pushes out my videos to the right eyeballs. You're reliant that your Instagram photos are getting to your followers. But we kind of don't control that. And just in a second, they can roll out a different feature, roll out how that platform works, and changes everything. So I think it's nice in the sense that in Canada, the likes got taken away for a temporary time because it made us realize that. And yeah. You had you called me that day. You're like, yo, this is crazy. I just realized, like, you how dependent I... Yeah, you totally. need these wake-up calls to also push you to try new things mm-hmm. in your career and 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 not feel not feel like you're working for the platform but do things for yourself and mm-hmm. you know the whole thing though about them taking away likes do you believe that that is helpful, helpful? cuz I, I have some thoughts about it i mean i don't know that it's not helpful but i also just think that it's such a band-aid solution like I if you're agree. if you're really talking about kids self-esteem then why aren't they rolling things out in these schools like support and different things like in in real life that are actually gonna help these kids like whether that's creating programs so that people can kids can find their passions or you know like mm-hmm. dance or cheerleading or hockey or all these things that gave me a lot of joy as a kid were my um, extracurricular activities where I think those things are now getting lost and kids are just sitting at home and they're scrolling on Instagram. They don't go outside anymore. Like, those are the th- more things that so I... Old. I know, which I'm but, not old. I'm 22. But I, I do see that there is a shift in in also confidence. And I think that, like, the fact that we didn't have to necessarily share all these things about ourselves at a young age was really important because it helped us really find our identities amongst our family and friends and people who loved us as opposed to having outside people judge us. Yeah, well, I think the big problem, or one problem, is that to a lot of these kids that are growing up using it is that their social media is who they are. And I think for yeah, us, it's, tied it's what to their we identity. do. Yeah, it's not yeah. who we are. Yeah. And I feel lucky that I can totally find the barrier. I can go on, do my things, catch up, see what my friends are doing, yeah. post my posts, post my videos, whatever. And then shut, and it, shut off. it off. And yeah. I think, I don't know if it's just because since I work in this industry, I'm so aware of the time that I spend on it. And well, it feels like work sometimes for us. So it's, it's okay. Well, sometimes, yeah. not always. We have... F- awesome jobs let's not like oh sugarcoat we're it very very privileged but at the same time i think we're able to find that line of like okay look you know today i'm just gonna be with my family my whole thing with it is that like you were saying it is a band-aid solution i understand the initiative of okay kids are relying too much of their self-esteem or self-worth based off of how many likes they're getting right like i agree that is a problem yeah but i think just taking it away doesn't fix the problem the problem is that they are relying on external sources for validation 100 percent. versus having that self-confidence from within Mm -hmm. and if it's not the likes they're going to base it off of they're going to base it off of how many comments they're getting or how many still how many followers they have even versions of that when we were growing up Mm -hmm. it just wasn't social media like nothing is actually changing there was that platform which was an awful platform ask fm yeah or like form Form spring Spring. yes (laughs) awful it was like it was anonymous literally anonymous messages about people whether that was based on their personality their physical looks and it it was was nasty nasty and people would write the meanest things and 
because it was anonymous, they felt like they could get away with it. So that is literally the exact same thing as social media. People hiding behind, you know, these platforms to write mean comments and basically troll online. So nothing is really changing. It's just... It's just the platform is changing. Yeah, same problem. So, same problem, and I think it has a lot more to do with putting the right support into schools so kids get the right attention and help that they need, along with, you know, parents enabling people's passions, which I don't think is happening enough, and I think was a huge play into how, you know, I would say a lot of my friends and I have become successful was that my parents really enabled my passions and and that's where they put their energy and their time because at the end of the day a kid is happiest doing what they love the thing is i don't know if it can i feel like that's a whole other beast to tackle to talk about like oh it's down to the parenting because because it's like if i was a parent right now if you didn't let your kid have social media they would be so ostracized and like what's the answer they they have like that's part of like the generation and i think yeah but i'm not saying so no value. i'm not saying maybe no social media i'm just saying emphasis on other i'm just saying well. emphasis on passion like i think that is like a real key to but enabling the- confidence because if we're talking really about confidence and people going online to get validation yeah. then we're talking about how kids feel like they have to go somewhere else to get that sure no, I agree. Sense. Whereas you and I growing up would be like, I would feel confident when I was like shining in a dance class or you would feel confident like shining on the cheerleading floor or yeah. any of these other things that gave us that happiness. So I think it's much more about finding what makes a kid happy mm-hmm. and and making sure that they spend time doing that. Yeah, and I still think like, I mean, this is again, just looking at like my younger cousins and that like they still are doing their sports. They're still doing their hockey. They're still doing all of that. I think maybe just one thing that is important to be aware of is screen time. And this is something that I've even found confronting. I mean, if you got an yeah. iPhone, you can check this out. It's the craziest thing because I realized that in a week I spend 25 hours on YouTube, which right. is absurd. And part of me, I justify because I'm like, oh, it's my job. I'm doing research. But also, I'm very aware that I'm just going on it for leisure and to like, right. keep up with like YouTube drama and like things that are not adding value YouTube to my life. YouTube drama. Oh, that's a whole other beast. But I think, honestly, just turning on, like, I have my app limits on. So I think for like Instagram, I have like two hours a day and then it'll be like, yo, get off Instagram and right. get on it for too long. And just having things to be more mindful about your use of, of your phone. Fo- oh, my God. Yo, you're having problems today. <gasps> Ugh. The allergies, um, but, but just being mindful of uh, of that is is the best step I think for now. And, yeah. and do I think this Instagram like thing is gonna last? No, I'm sure we'll get the likes back. At least in Canada, again, if you're like not from Canada, this is completely relevant to you. But unless I, they unless they roll unless it's globally. so effective that nobody has likes anymore. Right. But then again, it's just gonna move to something else. So I don't know if that's the answer. I get what they're doing. That's cool. But let's again, put it this not way, the problem. which I always say, let's, let's put, put it this way. way. If it were me growing up now, I don't think like I'm. I'm. What I'm trying to say is, it would be really hard to be a kid right now, and I appreciate oh, that. My I, heart fully. My heart goes out to them, and I appreciate the effort that parents are putting in, and I appreciate that it's a different world, and even a different world than what our parents grew up in. So I mean, like I don't know what the and right answer. Let's is. be real. And I'm afraid for when we have kids, truly, because I don't know what that looks I like. I do though, truly have so much hope though in terms of younger generations. I feel like when I look to older generations, I lose hope, and then when I look to the younger generations, I regain it because it's true. Kids are, and nobody gives kids enough credit. And They're I remember being so a, creative and so passionate and so cool and like I hate to use this word but so woke we have access to so much information with the internet that we can be so educated be so informed did you know that you take like photoshop classes in like grade three like my cousin who's literally in like grade three or four is more proficient in like adobe software than I am and I think that's incredible and I think there's no cap to learning no and it's just gonna push and it's gonna push these kids Mm -hmm. to be way more creative and I think that honestly like we're moving to a creative world like we're moving into like more creative industries more creative sectors and those are the jobs that are going to become way more important as opposed to the finance and like all of these like whatever it's i always, disagree really i think it's always going to be important we're always going to need doctors we're always going to need lawyers of we're course. always going to need financial um bankers etc cetera, etc cetera. but i truly believe and to be fair i studied this in university so there's actually like there's theoretics to back this up but we are honestly moving towards a more creative world and a more innovative world because of technology well i think with a lot of automation of jobs whether it be like no need for taxis anymore we're gonna have self self self-driven cars a lot of jobs like that will be replaced so i think people are gonna have a lot more time to focus on what they're passionate about so whether that comes to fruition with creative jobs sure um it's gonna be interesting though like i think as much as we talk about the cons of like the downsides of social media and and of course we're all aware of the negative effects we all experience it i still go on instagram and i'm like wow i hate myself the positives so far outweigh it and it's our jobs. I feel like we have to say we are such advocates for it. Totally. But I truly think the amount of 
the the things that I've gained from it in terms of knowledge, insights, perspective. It totally outweighs the cons. I agree. It's it's and like now we live in just this beautiful global world where you can go online oh. and have a conversation with someone or see someone's life happening on a totally different scale and mm-hmm. or um you know having a totally different experience in another place in the world and I think that's really beautiful. So it's it's very beautiful. I think one thing it's we- easy to be negative about it. I actually think sometimes it can it it is it is up to us to challenge ourselves to find the positives because it it really does connect all of us at the end of the day. And speaking of positives, um, something that I like to do in my everyday life, and Tori, I know you're on board with this, yeah. because every other friend hates that we do this at the <laughs> end of each day. And I think what we should start to do is do this at every at the end of every at the end of every podcast yeah. is wrap it up with some roses and thorns. Whoop. Woo! Tori, what's Roses and Thorns? Our friends hate that we do this. We love it. Um, So Roses and Thorns. So sharing roses is basically sharing the rose of your day and or week. We like to do two because, the again, positives always outweigh the negatives. So the thorn, you get one thorn. Usually we do that one first to get the thorn out of the way. And then we, I don't know where the rosebud came from. I think that might have been like an invention (laughs) <laughs> I, I, this might have come from, like, some student council. Yeah, like, I don't I know where it came from. But anyways, the the rose bud is something that you're looking forward to, whether today or this week. Um, a, short like term, to, a short term... Um goal or to. or happy thing. So, so basically what ahead. we do, we do roses and thorns every day to kind of self-reflect at the end of the day. But I think it'd be kind of a nice thing if we brought it into the yeah. podcast. And it sounds... It's also, it's also like a gratefulness exercise oh, totally. because it's all just about recognizing the positive things and letting there be a negative thing yeah. but letting that you know pass through and, and moving on from it and what's so funny is because it, I get when people roll their eyes at it because it does seem so dumb we're like I'm gonna do rose and I thorns. don't think it's dumb I think it's kind of beautiful and I'm just gonna bring it to the podcast I just also don't think it's dumb and I think that people that don't like it are people that lack vulnerability because we've played it with friends hey. that are get like really uncomfortable and I think it's just the fact that they don't want to be vulnerable and like share share their feelings and I think people have to work on that so here we are working on it. Tori, working do you have it. any roses and thorns from this podcast or this day so far? Um, Sure. So, rose is that I woke up at 6 a.m., which is unreal for me because, like, I normally don't get up that early. And I was just thorn so... to get it out of the way first. I know. Okay, you but it's it fine. Okay, it's fine. Uh, but I was so organized this morning, and I have, like, a shoot later today, and yeah. I, like, made my lunch. And, guys, I do not cook, like, by any means. So, this was just, like, I was just very prepared for this day. You really were. Um, Another rose is that I have dinner with my parents tonight. I'm super excited for that. They're the real ones, so I love to spend time with them. And I would say the thorn is just that our batteries have been going wacko wacko today on this podcast. They've died like eight times, and we've had to like cut away and restart. Yeah. So if it's a bit choppy, you know why. Um, it's just the fact that the batteries on the cameras are being crazy. And what about a rosebud? A rosebud. Looking forward bud. to short term. Ooh, it is my childhood best friend's bachelorette party this Sunday, and that makes me feel old. So, but I'm looking forward to it because it's my first friend who's getting married, and I'm excited to like experience a bachelorette that's my friend's. So. Yeah, that's really fun. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me think. A thorn. I woke up extra phlegmy today. Woohoo! Love the seasonal hay fever. Um, so that's definitely my thorn. A uh, rose. Um, there was leftover coffee from last night, so I didn't need to make a fresh pot. Ooh, I just got to beautiful. sip and enjoy. And another rose is the weather has been getting so good, and I'm it's very horrible affected. today. Well, today it's bad, but like the weather this week has been putting me in such a good that's mood. True. I'm so good affected yesterday. by like sunshine and like being able to be outside. Um, so that that's been good. Health is wealth. Health is wealth, baby. And a rosebud. I'm looking forward to. Okay, this is going to confuse the viewers, but I'm going to say I'm looking forward to this podcast hitting air. Yeah. Because we're going to be launching all three of these at the same time. Obviously, if you're listening, you know this. Um, But I just, I feel like we've been talking about doing this podcast for a while, so it feels so good to finally be doing it, and I'm so excited to see people's reactions. It also feels like our little gem right now. Like, it feels like our own little, we're in a closet talking, and it's like our own little... (laughs) <laughs> yeah. It's our own little fun, but also like we we're having fun. So, anyways, thanks for listening. If you have finished episode two of Potty Talk, God bless your soul, and thank you so much for listening. We love you all, and we'll be back for more. And stay tuned. This has been Potty Talk, the, the podcast, podcast where we shit talk ourselves. ourselves. See you next time. I'm Tor, and I'm Jack. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening.